today we'll continue on the second part and the last part of Genesis chapter 7. And the topic for today will be the 40-day wipeout program. God has a program for 40 days. He's going to wipe out the whole human race. And today we'll try to answer some questions. We'll try to answer the three of these questions which we've picked out. I'm sure you have more questions, but uh, we probably can handle these three only. Question number one, the sources of water, the effects and the storage of this excess water that came during the flood. Where did it come from? What did it do? And where did the water go to after the flood? Question number two, was this flood localized? Or was it a universal flood? And this question has been a, you know, a, a question of contention for many Bible teachers. The third question is, why? Why did God use water to destroy the whole world? Have you ever thought about that? Why water? And we do know that the second time when God is going to destroy this world will be with fire. Because this is what the Bible tells us. Why water? Why fire later? So, before we begin, let's just all look to God in prayer. Father, what a joy for us to be able to come here in person to be able to fellowship with each other and more importantly, to find ourselves in your presence. We thank you this morning that uh, you've given us an opportunity to worship you with songs. Now we want to worship you by turning to your word and allowing you to speak to us. We just ask that your spirit will open our eyes and teach us and as we hear your voice, we ask for strength and boldness to be doers of your word, not just hearers. And it is with excitement that now we want to turn to your word and we are eagerly waiting to hear your voice. We want to ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing from our previous study, we know that the physical ark and the flood both serve to foreshadow the need for Jesus Christ, who's the antitype of the ark. The ark is a type of Jesus who came to save us from a future destruction in the last days, when this earth will then again be destroyed for a second time with all the people, all the wicked people in a huge ball of fire. Having seen not just the physical lesson, the literal lesson, there was this spiritual lesson too. And God wanted to communicate to us that the physical event of the flood, it was real. And you and I can be confident that what is recorded for us in the Bible is both factual and, record and accurate. Recording the acts, the works of an, our amazing supernatural God. And at the end of our study this morning, we are also going to find out more lessons 
not just the literal lesson that we are seeing. Because if it is, then we could have done it in five minutes. I can tell you where the water came from, what did it do, and where did it go to. Right? And all those three questions, we can do it in five minutes, and we can all go home. But if that's all you came for, then that's sad. Because you've missed the more important lesson that God is trying to teach us this morning. So hang in there. All right? And we're going to begin our study this morning from verse 10, Genesis 7, verse 10. Let me read to you 10 and 11. Verse 10 reads, And after the seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. So there we have it, the two sources of water. One from below and one from above. And it, it, in the text itself, it describes for us like there was this huge explosion. The springs or the fountains just exploded and water just gushed out in torrents. And there was another source from above. It's, if you can imagine, there's this huge water tank up there. And there was this crack or there was this door, a sluice door like a dam. It just opened up. And all of a sudden, you have all this huge amount of water just came pouring down on planet Earth. Now, I'm going to say very honestly here that it is difficult with, to describe with certainty what actually happened then. There, were, there are many theories, and you can read all about them, and you're going to waste half your life because they are just theories. And I do not want to speculate or spend too much time to teach on something which the Bible does not really tell us much about. There is just enough for us. But the Bible does tell us the storage, the effect, and where did it go to. Firstly, where did they come from? The water came from Below and above. Below, what was it? A water table, a reservoir? You call it what you like. What about above? Some people call it, there's a, a canopy, like a curtain, a water bubble. You can call it, call it what you like. There are many people with different theories. But the truth is, we cannot be sure. But we do know that, that there was this huge explosion of water from below and there was this huge crack from above. And it made a huge change to our landscape. What was the effect? The effect on our landscape before, before the flood. And I can only imagine, and I'm not sure again, that there was this huge land mass, one piece of land with some high mountains and there were some seas and there were some rivers. Not many, but there were some. But when the flood came, the sheer weight and force of the moving water caused the land to crack, split, and it drifted apart. And most people would accept this because if you take a look at the map of the world, you can almost join them up. And in between, there's the ocean, the seas, where the cracks are. This will make for interesting reading and studying if you have this interest. But I'm not here to, to dwell on this. This is not the platform. But I'm just telling you what it could possibly happen but after the flood, 
because of this crack and movement of land, mountains and valleys were formed. So land, land that used to be at sea level have now been forced upwards. And for this reason today, they can explain why they found the fossils of fish and animals, huge animals, mammoths, some of them, they're found on top of very high mountain peaks. How did it get there? That is how it happened. The land cracked and there was a lot of pressure. Some of the land were forced upwards. And then valleys were formed too. And today we do know for a fact that many of these pieces of land are floating. They are actually moving. And we call them tectonic plates. And these tectonic plates are still moving. And as they move against each other, some will be forced down, some will be moving up. And that's how earthquakes are formed and tsunamis are the results of them. What about the valleys? When we think of valleys, we think of the mountain valleys. But actually, there are huge valleys in the ocean floor. And they are bigger and deeper than you and I can ever imagine. And that's where the water went to. Because in Genesis chapter 8, verse 3, we are told that it took five months after the water has stopped rising, it took five months for the water to recede. So it went down into the valleys of the ocean. And you may be asking, Pastor John, how do you know? Interestingly, God does tell us a little bit. In Psalm 104, verses 8 and 9, Psalm 104, verses 8 and 9. Let me read to you from the NASB translation. Verse 8. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established them for, established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. Did you get that? To cover the earth. The water, in verse 9, were confined by God. He set a boundary, so that they will not return to cover the earth again. Some of you may not know that the deepest, deepest valleys, they are not on land. How do you measure a valley? You measure from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the valley. That's the height. And the deepest valleys are really found in the ocean. And only until recently, they found this trench. They call it a trench. It's called the Marianas Trench, which is actually seven miles deep from the sea level to the bottom of the trench, seven miles, which is 11,000 meters. And interestingly, only recently, and I saw a documentary, on these valleys, they actually have a river. And you say, what on earth are you talking about, Pastor John? It's the ocean. How can a river be in the ocean? And you'll be surprised that in these valleys, it has a separate life of its own. It, the water current is moving differently from the water above. 
It's amazing. How can that happen? Now, you may be thinking, oh, seven miles, how deep can that be? If you ever do diving, if you go below 200 meters, you can die. All right? If you go below 200 meters, and this is 11,000 meters, and if you were to take Mount Everest, which is only five and a half miles above sea level, or 8,800 meters above sea level. You drop Mount Everest into this trench, you still have one and a half miles of water above Mount Everest. And until recently, no man-made submarine can even reach there because the water pressure is simply too great. You crack up the whole submarine. But until recently, they have got this uh, uh, little drone thing and they were able to take some pictures of what's at the bottom of this trench. And what do you know? This may not be the only trench. There could be others that has, have not been discovered yet. But that's how great God is. He created all these valleys to store and store the water. Then we move on to the next part about the changes to our weather, to our climate. But before Noah's time, there was no rain. There were no seasons. You don't have spring, autumn, summer, and fall, but the, or winter. After the flood, we not only have the seasons, but we also have hurricanes. We have droughts. We have all kinds of problems with the weather. So really, the flood has drastically changed the original earth, as in Genesis chapter 1. How much and to what degree we will never really know. But as to how or what exactly happened, the Bible does not really tell us. And if the Bible did, I want to tell you, I don't know. All right? If you come across some verses that tells us more, share with us. It will be interesting for me to know how drastically the flood has changed the original earth. But there's another thing that I do know. And that is how an earthquake, and we had some major earthquakes before. 2004, if some of you remember, Banda Aceh. 230,000 people died worldwide. 230,000 people died worldwide. And it destroyed places like Penang, Phuket. And I remember during that time, it was December, very near the Christmas. And I think Bantong almost made the trip there. Right? Uh, if, if he had, maybe he won't be sitting here today. Right? But that was how bad it was, 2004. And in 2011, there was another earthquake. A nine magnitude, nine magnitude is way off the chart. And what did it do to planet Earth? And one of the most significant things it did, not just destroying the nuclear plant in Fukushima, but that earthquake actually shifted our North Pole by 17 centimeters. 17 centimeters. Can you imagine the North Pole being shifted? 17 centimeters is about six and a half inches. Something like this. All right. And not only that, Japan now has moved eight feet nearer to the US. And in the southern shores, 
it has sunk. There are a lot of other things that has happened. And that simple earthquake alone shifted the North Pole. Can you imagine the, the zillion tons of water that came down? What did it do to our planet? But that's not really the focus of our study this morning. Yes, there is this creation story we find in Genesis 1. Yes, there is this flood account we find in, in, a, in our study here in, in chapter 7, 8, and 8. And these are factual stories, factual accounts. And we see them being proven in science, in geography, in archaeology, in history. And in every early civilization, every early civilization and culture, they have their own version of the creation story and the flood story. And this is one of the other reasons, really, why God, many years later, had to get Moses to write down the true version the true version, the version according to God, because he was there to tell us how he made everything, how he made everything. That is the true version. But when man started to rebel, the holy God had to destroy the whole human race. And that's where we find ourselves today in our study in chapter 7. And let's continue. Verses 17 to 24. And I'm going to flash up these four verses for you because if you look at these four verses and in some amazing way, these four verses form one section and the next four verses form another section. And this is where we are going to get the real message that God is trying to speak to us today. In these first four verses, let me read to you first. Verses 17 to 20. Verse 17. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. Verse 19, they rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Verse 20, the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. That's about 22 feet. As I was looking at this study, I was quite troubled because I didn't know what to make of it. It seems to be a repetition. But then, if we were to look at it in two sections, we'll find that this first section speaks about the waters. It speaks about the flood. In the next four verses, it's going to speak to us about man and the animals. And within these two sections, God placed in it a very important message he's trying to get across to us. We are told in verse 17 that the flood waters covered all the high mountains and the ark was lifted above 
the highest mountain, meaning there was really no danger of the ark crashing into anything. The water covered more than 20 feet above the highest peak. And it was wooden. And if you know about shipping, 20 feet of draft is huge. Today, many of the ocean containers going, uh, ocean going containers can, can take 20 feet of water easily. And those are huge and heavy. But yet, God wants to make it clear to us that the ark was in no danger. But this would also mean that the flood water having covered the entire earth completely, this would also mean that the earth was really a bowl of water. A bowl of water. And from the language, from the text here, we can clearly see that God has brought a universal flood, a universal flood. And we see that in a couple of verses, beginning in chapter 7, verse 4. And then later on, verses 21 to 23, and right up to chapter 8, verse 21. When God said that he would destroy every living thing, every living thing. And in verse 19, if all the high mountains were covered with water, that would mean the entire planet must have been completely immersed, covered under water. And anyone reading it for the first time any logical person would come to the conclusion that the flood was universal, universal and not localized. Tragically today, there are some Christians who would hold to the view that it was a limited or localized flood. And they would explain it this way that Moses was using the language of appearance. Because he could only write what he could see. Kind of like a figurative language. But the first rule of biblical interpretation is that scripture is to be taken literally, literally, unless the text demands otherwise. Otherwise, and this is happening today, some Christians, and I'm talking even about evangelical Christians, who would take hell figuratively, figuratively. But they hope that heaven is real. What crazy people do we have in this world? Another problem with this viewpoint, that it was localized. If it was merely a local flood, why didn't God just simply tell Noah to move to another place? So by local, we mean, for example, Topayo is flooding. Then go to Passeris. Come and stay with me. I'm on the 10th floor. Shouldn't be a problem. But it wasn't a local flood. So I asked myself during this study, why then? Why? Why would a Christian, a God-loving Christian, hold on to 
a view that is not even biblical. And the reason is this, and it is the very same reason why they cannot and would not believe in many other parts of scripture. They would not believe that God can create the universe in six days, in six 24-hour days, literal days. They could not believe that God would destroy the whole world because he's a loving God. And they would not believe that God can redeem the Israelites during the Passover and deliver them through the Red Sea on dry ground. And the most tragic part is that many Christians today cannot and refuse to believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary because it was it's simply scientifically impossible. Scientifically impossible. So what do they do? Just because if they, they, they now uh, realize that science contradicts the Bible, biology contradicts the Bible, what do they do? They try to reconcile the scripture to modern science. And they think that God needs their help. And they set out to reconcile the Bible to science. Let me give you one example. For the longest time, there's this problem with evolution and creation. Which is which? And we know that the Bible teaches creation. But many of the scientists today believe in the theory of evolution. Remember, it's a theory. It's not a fact. So we have this conflict. Creation versus evolution. Which is which? And some of these Christians, well-meaning Christians, but they are naive. And they don't believe in the God of the Bible, who is a supernatural God. So these people, these naive Christians, came out with a theory. They call it theistic, theistic evolution. Theistic is God guiding evolution. God created everything from a single cell. But he guided this cell to multiply and change into a worm that changed into a monkey that changed to a man. That is theistic evolution. And where did all this come from? It comes from the devil. The Bible never teaches this. Let me say this to you very kindly. If you cannot believe in the literal text of Genesis chapter 1, you will not believe in Revelation chapter 22. Let me say that again. If you cannot believe in the literal text of Genesis chapter 1, you will never believe in Revelation chapter 22 and everything in between. And for this reason today, some evangelical Christians, as I've said earlier, will not believe in hell. Is that not true? We are seeing this teaching coming, becoming more and more popular, but they would love to believe in heaven. What crackpots are these? If there's no hell, then why would you need heaven? 
cherry pick, they choose what they like to believe, and they throw out the rest. But Yahweh, our Yahweh is the creator God, and he's more than able to do the supernatural, to do the impossible, to perform miracles. That's the God of the Bible. There are many things we will never know with certainty. That's true. The how or the what concerning the flood. But God doesn't want us to be preoccupied with all this. Just like he doesn't want us to be preoccupied with studying angels. There are some people who dedicate their whole life to study, to study about angels. We have to study about Jesus. We have to study about who he is, what he has done for us, and how he wants us to live our lives. That is what God wants us to do. So he doesn't want us to be preoccupied with studying or finding out everything about the flood. But rather, from our text today, this is what God wants to tell us. Two important biblical truths about himself. Two important biblical truths about himself. The first one, we find it in Genesis chapter 7, verse 18. God is the giver of new starts, new starts, new beginnings. That is our God. He's the giver. The second biblical truth that he wants to teach us this morning can be found in verse 22, which we will get to shortly. That God is the able deliverer. He's able to deliver us. These are the two truths. So let's begin. Verse 18. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Let's just pause for a moment and remember, try to recall how the world looks like at this point, at the peak of the flood. It was all covered by water. And like I say, if we were able to look at planet Earth, say from moon, if you're standing from moon, you look at planet Earth, it would look like a blue ball of water. Maybe not so blue, maybe like muddy brown. I don't know, but it's all covered with water. And not only that, if you were to look carefully, there is a small wooden box tossed around in the raging waters. That was how it would look at the peak of the flood. And if you were to turn the clock back and go back in time to the beginning, to the book of Genesis chapter 1, when God created the universe, the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, Take a look at this verse. And I want you to notice the structure of this verse. Verse 2 reads, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The word moving in the Hebrew is like fluttering. Like a bird fluttering. And here, straight away, we have this uh, 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 image of the spirit being represented like a dove, moving, fluttering over the surface of the water. Straight away, we will recognize the phrase that we find in chapter 17. Verse 18. The earth was formless 
darkness covered the deep raging water and the spirit of god was moving over the surface of the water and if we compare this verse genesis 1 verse 2 with what happened during the flood at the peak of it we notice the similarity that the earth is again covered in water and the ark which was a type of christ was floating moving above the surface of the deep so in short the earth has actually returned to its original state covered in water and we, we may even say that god is restarting creation restarting creation there was no second creation there was only one creation it is as if god pressed the reset button and this was made necessary because of the sin of man god had to press the reset and here we have a beautiful picture of god in his redemption plan he gave a fresh new start to noah and his family and we're going to see throughout scriptures that god is the giver of fresh starts many fresh starts he gave fresh start to abraham to isaac to jacob and he will give those fresh starts to you too and i need many fresh starts but our god is the giver of fresh starts aren't you glad well it is good news that god wants to give us fresh new starts but we have to ask the question is he able has he got the power to do it easy to say but can he do it and in some amazing way the next four verses will give us the answer take a look at the next section and i've color coded it for you here those in brown are animals and living things and people and then the animals oh sorry animals are in kind of like blue and the birds are in purple. Let me read them to you first. Verses 21 to 24. Verse 21. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, and all the creatures that swarm over the earth. And all mankind. Verse 22. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. What a way to end the section. But it is so clear here when God said everything, it means everything. And as if it is not enough at the end of this passage in verse 24. 
The Bible tells us that the waters flooded the earth for 150 days, five months. If you manage to climb to the highest mountain, and on that mountain, you climb the highest tree, and you escape the waters, can you live for five months? This section is just to tell us that finally, Finally, God was satisfied that the flood had made its intended purpose. That, that is to wipe out everything, everything, except those in the ark. So to answer our last question that we put up earlier, question number three, why did God use water to destroy the whole earth. And it may not surprise you because you and I know what happens to animals and people who are floating around in the water. All the corpses and all the carcasses. Now, corpses is for human. Carcasses are for animals. They start to decompose. And after five months, there will not be much left. Because we do know that it took five months from the start of the flood to the peak is five months and from the peak when the water stopped rising another five months before the water receded so all together we are looking at at least nine months if you can live in the water for nine months i can i can i can stay alive for nine minutes in the water i would have drowned but nine months Decomposition would have set in. But there will be some animals, dead animals, the carcasses and cops who will get trapped in the mud. And when the mud dried up, that's when today archaeologists will discover fossils, mostly of animals. But they, they are no longer there. But the shape is there. Fossils of fish and animals. So that's what happened. Another thing that happened, and this might freak you out, and that is dead plants, dead animals, and dead people. For in some ways, they are all sucked into the ground. And that's how we get fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel that we have, the crude oil today, comes from dead plants, dead animals, and I think a lot of dead people. Under, when they are underground, under huge pressure and over a long period of time, they all become fossil fuel. Now, again, I'm not going to go into all that. You can read it up for yourself. But the only thing is next time you press your accelerator, all right, you may have uh, you know, some human beings going out from the exhaust pipe. I don't know, all right? But that is how fossil fuel comes about. Now we have really completed looking at the water part, the flood part, in which God has revealed himself as the giver of fresh new starts. A giver of fresh new starts. And in the next four verses, we are now going to be redirected back 
to that which is at the very heart of God. And that is man. Man. And in this last section, God only not only repeated that he had successfully wiped out all the rebellious people, but he wants to reveal to us our next important message. And I'm going to flash out again the four verses, but this time notice the pattern. Notice the pattern. Look at the pattern in verse 21. It starts out by telling us everything died, perish. What are they? Birds, livestock, wild animals, and it finishes up with mankind. Mankind. And if you have to look at verse 23, this order has been reversed. Reversed. Look at the order now. People, which is mankind, animals, animals, creatures, livestock, and last, birds, birds. The order in verse 23 had been reversed. Did you notice that? And if you are quick enough, you would realize that these two repetitions have bracketed, bracketed, and closed. We call it parenthesis. Something in the middle. And what's in the middle? Dry land. Dry land. Right? Verse 22 reads, Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Another interesting thing that you need to know, that in the original manuscripts, the word land is in italics in your Bible. It will be in italics because it's not in the original manuscripts. The word there is just simply dry, dry. And this is so huge, it's so important. Because if we look into this word dry, in the Hebrew, it's karabah. I probably would have the pronunciation very wrong, but it's karabah. And it means a desert, it means dry. Yes, it is usually associated with land or ground, but it's simply dry in the manuscript. And it is used only eight times in the whole of the Old Testament. Eight times. And each time when it is used, and you can see here from the references I've flashed out here, first time is here in verse 22 of Genesis 7. The next time when it's used is in Exodus 14. And then Joshua, 2 Kings, Ezekiel and Haggai. But in the Old Testament, the commonly used word for dry land is dry land. But in Hebrew, it's yabasa. It means dry ground. And I want to contrast these two words. And in and another amazing way God has used these two words together to show that they are different. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, where this word occurred. And in some strange way, this word dry land is in verse 22. And I want you to take note of the strong uh, uh, Reference for this word, dry, and then dry land is 3004. And I'm going to flash the next two verses, Exodus 14, 21 and 22, where these two words are used side by side. Take a look. 
Exodus chapter 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided. Verse 22. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Many of us are familiar with this account. It was Moses taking the Israelites through the Red Sea on dry land. Now, to read it superficially, you would think that, yes, God turned the sea into dry land and they crossed on dry land. It makes sense. But God didn't say that. God said he turned the sea into dry, which is the first word, karabal. But the second word is dry land. In the first word, the land is also in italics in your Bible, which means that it is not there in the original manuscript. What is of interest to us here is that God wants to tell us that for all the eight times this word is being used, in the Old Testament, God is revealing himself as the supernatural God whose almighty hand delivered his people. It wasn't just about the dry land. That God wants to tell us that it was his hand at work in redeeming his people during the Passover and then delivering them through the Red Sea. It was about his redemption plan. And I can, if you love, like it, you can uh, uh, study all those eight instances when it was being used. It is always, always used to refer to God's almighty hand at work. Wow. When I saw this, I was so excited, so excited. But the story doesn't end here. Because in our next study, when we get to chapter 8, there is the mention of wind. And straight away we know that this account in chapter 7 is tied into Exodus chapter 14 that Yahweh, the almighty creator God, is not only able to redeem us and give us all a fresh new start, but he's also, he also has the power to deliver us from the grip of sin and Satan and to save us from punishment in hell. So, against this horrific picture, against this terrifying background of God's ferocious judgment and wrath, death and destruction, especially in the last verse when God mentioned he intentionally kept the water for another five months, It only serves to tell us that God's judgment, His wrath, is thorough. He doesn't miss anybody. If you're rebellious, God will get you. But God is also telling us that just as He had redeemed Israel with the blood of the, the, the Passover lamb, and then he delivered them through the Red Sea. He can do the same for us 
today. He can do the same for us today. That's the good news. If we only were to believe in Jesus as the perfect Passover lamb of God. But if you refuse, there will come a day soon when instead of the rain, there will be tribulation. Instead of the flood, fire will now totally destroy this world. And you and I know for a fact how this earth is going to end up in a ball of fire. And today we all know that it is possible because today we have so many nuclear warheads that is enough to destroy the world 20 times over. 20 times over, not just once. And yes, they've started to de-escalate and reduce the nuclear warheads, but there are still many warheads around. And Peter himself wrote that the elements will melt. And for almost 180 years, 100 and 1,800 years after Jesus, everybody thinks that Peter was drunk. He's talking nonsense. How can the elements melt? Because the element is the most basic. It, you cannot split. But it was only in the 1900 that they discovered that they can split the atoms. And that's how we got the atom bomb. And that was how America brought Japan to its knees in 1940, I think 45, during at the end of the Second World War. We were just 75 years. They just celebrated it last yesterday. 75 years marking the end of the Second World War. Today we know that fire can destroy this world and it will happen because God knew it. God told us it will happen. So what are the signs? Just as Jesus had prophesied in Luke 21, Jesus said there will be wars, earthquakes, famine, plagues, chaos in the sky. We're going to see meteorites, stars falling from the sky hitting planet Earth, causing not just earthquakes, but tsunamis. This is going to happen. These are the signs of the last days. Not only do we see wars going on and on in the Middle East, never ending, and in many other parts of the world. Today, we are seeing famine. We're seeing famine. And some of you may be saying, huh? I thought we were producing enough. Did you hear the news yesterday? In China, after a very long time, and they had bumper harvest, and yet yesterday, President Xi Jinping came out. What did he ask the people to do? He asked them not to waste food. Why? Because for the past few months, 27 provinces in China have been battered by floods. Floods, very rare. And many of the crops were, were destroyed and there were insects infestations and there were cases of swine fever, plagues, diseases. And for the first time, we hear China is facing food shortage. That's why he came out to ask them not to waste food. 27 provinces, can you beat that? God will destroy this wicked world as we know it. That will happen. But Jesus also loves us and you do not have to spend your eternity in hell. 
you do not have to. Why? Because our God is a giver of new stars. We are all new creatures. We can be new creatures. And our God is more than able to deliver us from the grip of sin and Satan. So today, our passage is not just about God getting upset and he destroyed the whole human race with a great flood. It's also not about Noah and his family getting out of the ark after the flood and then learning how to get used to the new normal. No, it's not about that. But it is really about God telling Noah and us that he's the giver of many new starts and that he is more than able to deliver us from the power of sin. We can be free of sin so that we can live for Jesus. But his only demand from Noah and us, no different. His demand on Noah and us is that we must continue to keep God's true normal, not the new normal. And what is this true normal for Noah and for all of us? This true normal, and it has never changed. It has always been God's demand that we obey Him 100%. We obey Him 100%. This true normal has never changed. It's always been the same. That's the same demand God has on Noah, on me, and on you. I hope we will say yes to God and start to follow after Jesus, listening to His voice and obeying Him. God bless.